the support of entrepreneurs, um, people who are currently entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, um, want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Uh, so each week we have two companies present about what they're working on and then um, some great Q&A from the audience uh, trying to learn more. So we, we're all about supporting uh, entrepreneurs, so we, we ask that you ask good and, and tough questions um, that are, are helpful questions for our entrepreneurs. So this week is a little uh, unique in that um, we're going to start testing that uh, an idea um, that we've been working on with the Kauffman Foundation where once a month um, we turn away from doing our typical startup um, type companies to um, a theme for the month. So this uh, month it's urban communities. So obviously there's a lot of really cool stuff happening downtown. So we wanted to take a, um, a week and highlight some of that um, and then talk about where we're going as a community forward. So. Um, next month, we're going to talk about the arts. Um, we're going to do a month with students coming and presenting about their companies. So it's going to be really exciting. So if you have ideas for some of our themed weeks that are going to happen once a month, we'd love to hear it. So, um, so today we've got two great companies, um, uh, or organizations, I guess, the other one of them are companies. Um, first one is uh, Guthrie Green, uh, which I think everyone's familiar with. So we're going to talk about uh, the process of uh, creating Guthrie Green and what that experience has been like. Um, and then we're going to um, talk about downtown as a whole and, and what's happening with downtown. So, uh, so to kick us off, uh, Stan Doyle is going to come and talk about Guthrie Green. So give him a hand. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Stan Doyle. I'm a senior program officer with the George Kaiser Family Foundation, and um, I'm working with learning how to use this. Today we're talking about Guthrie Green. Um, this project started in uh, 2007, more or less, before I was with the foundation, um, when uh, GKFF was looking uh, kind of to make an investment in the arts. There was uh, um, some designers in town, and um, they pointed out the Brady Arts District was right for work. You know, I think a lot of people who have lived here have known that for a long time. Um, but with the foundation, it was kind of a, just a, contemplating what investments could be made downtown. Um, the other part of this was uh, the Eugene Atkins collection is currently uh, kind of uh, taken care of by the Philbrook and the Fred Jones Museum at OU. Uh, at this time, in 2007, uh, the foundation was working with other philanthropists to try to retain this in Oklahoma. Uh, if you're not familiar with the collection, it's uh, estimated value about $50 million, uh, one of the best collections of contemporary Native American Southwestern art. And so, for that reason, uh, the foundation purchased half of the Tulsa Paper Company building that's just to the south of Guthrie Green. The other piece was what really they thought was needed was a green space for kind of a community gathering spot. Here you see the top image is uh, before. That was a uh, central freight. Uh, they had probably somewhere near 100 uh, semi-trucks come in daily to drop off and transfer loads. and. Um, then obviously down below is one of our early uh, after pictures. Um, another key component of this was a geothermal well field. This is to provide uh, the ground source water for uh, heating and cooling in the Pulse Paper Company building and the AHA. Uh -huh. And um, this is just a diagram to kind of show you how it works. It's about 120 wells and 15 circuits circulates water to the Tulsa Paper Company and AHA uh -huh buildings where it's then used in heat pumps to heat and cool the building. So down below it, there's 120, 500 foot wells. That, that was kind of the first phase of the project. Um, what we found were, uh, we, we knew for sure, because there was an old gas station on the corner, that there were a couple of fuel tanks. Uh, we were able to get a brownfield grant um, to remove them and we kind of treat the, the earth. Uh, we found 12 fuel tanks. So that's uh, eight undocumented fuel tanks. This is something they'll run across everywhere downtown, and, that, and that's the oldest part of the city, uh, kind of the Brady Greenwood areas, and um, that's one of the challenges of developing areas, just the ancient infrastructure, and just, you know, AT&T has lines down there they think are somewhere around here. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, solar canopy was another part of this. We received a grant from the Oklahoma Department of Commerce um, to construct a well field and also to purchase solar panels to help for the operation of the building uh, for the park. Um, and you can see the statistics about um, 49. This is from last fall, so it's, it's grown since then, but 
um, you know, it's not a huge uh, contributor, but it is something um, that helps just with the operation of the park. Um, so we built a park, and uh, this was something the foundation had never done before. I was, you might have heard the gathering place, so we're doing it again, whether we really know what we're doing or not. And uh, so a big part of this was you can build a green space. We all knew this. There's companies out there that consult on green spaces and how to activate them. So we bought their books. And um, we knew that green space is important, but activating is really the key piece. Um, so we started early on the programming. We kind of stopped design in order to put the stage together and uh, to design it so it would be a truly useful performance space. Um, I think in the beginning, the stage was kind of an afterthought, so we really had to put them on hold and say we brought in stage designers to design something that would be really helpful, especially for putting things on quickly. Um, we imagine in January you might have opportunities to really do something on those beautiful days when nothing else is going on. Um, so, we want to do programming, we'll build the infrastructure for it. Um, we've, uh, Aaron Miller has been a huge part of developing this, but we have fitness programming five days a week, uh, maybe seven days a week. Uh, we have uh, Food Truck Wednesdays, something Aaron had uh, kind of his appointment on. Uh, Thursday night movies, Sunday market, and concerts. And these are all things that we just, wouldn't it be nice if we did this and see how it goes. Um, this is done in, in partnership with a number of different entities, as you can see here. Um, Keep, you know, obviously the funding. Uh, this is about a half a million dollar project. Uh, we have, um, I'm sorry, this moves so quickly. Uh, staff, we have to hire staff in order to help make this happen. And obviously we rely a lot on volunteers to help us with each of these events. I mean, it's pushing up to seven days a week. The other thing we do, uh, the staff also runs the fly loft across the street. We run rehearsal spaces that we operate. Um, and all this is done pretty, Pretty minimal um, cost to the user, and then event development. We have a number of things we do outside of the park throughout downtown, and that is all. Well, thank you very so much. much. So, if you haven't been here before, now's the time. I'm Baron Ryan, by the way, one of the other community organizers. Now's the time that we get to, for 20 minutes, ask questions, and then uh, Senator, well, you also have the opportunity to go and ask questions of the community as well. That's, that's also possible. We get to engage on what they're doing, uh, why they're doing it, and, and hopefully how they can do it better. So if you have a question, then just raise your hand and get my attention. I'll be running around. Uh, I'll keep an idea of who's, who's in line uh, mentally. To kick things off, Stan, could you tell us specifically, could you speak to the mission behind Guthrie Green? And, and you've been, it's been open for what, a couple years now? Uh, could you talk about how the programming has, has helped your mission uh, and, and what, what you've learned over the past couple of years? Um, well, I, the mission um, really probably wasn't even articulated until the park was built, but it was really to become a community gathering place for Tulsa, something that, um, to help kind of enliven the heart of downtown. And, uh, and I think it, it all goes back to the GKFF mission, which against this is something we've discussed a lot recently. Um, maybe not so much early on. Um, so we're really still just kind of articulating it as what is important to Tulsa to make it a great place to live, what makes a great city. Um, this is something that the discussion has gone on a long time. And uh, you know, we don't have a coast. We've got our Arkansas River that we're doing our best to beautify. Um, and I think that always fell in the arts. Tulsa's got a great history in the arts. And um, so this is something that just, again, originally it was just kind of having a gathering place, not really imagining what would happen with the great green space. But uh, we realized early on that we really wanted to make it an active space. So bringing that programming to really kind of engage more people in the arts in Tulsa um, and have a nice space where people can enjoy things like this for free. And what have you learned from the programming that you've done? Uh, has it been working? Well, what we learned, yeah, that's a good point. What we've learned is that the appetite 
for these kinds of programs is immense. Um, we, uh, we're really operating off a hunch, so thank God that we have a good idea. Um, but it was, uh, it was amazing to us that people would come out day after day, week after week, to participate in the programming. Um, we were amazed at just the success on social media where we had events that we planned two days in advance and we had five, six hundred people out there. So it was just the, the appetite of Tulsa's to get out and engage. And I think it's been eye-opening for a lot of people is that there's really a broad community of people who want to participate in things like this. This is kind of a follow-up question and you, you, hopefully it's a little bit more than just a hunch. Is there a programming committee? What what facilitates you guys deciding what's going into, and you had a brief description up there of some of the stuff that's coming up this year. What, how do you determine what your program is going to be? We developed the series early on. Um, we thought it was just a simple way to have a weekly series. People knew that they could come out on a Sunday and see a concert. What we tried to do is let the programming come to us. So we reached out to a lot of different entities, Tulsa Performing Arts and Trust, Chad Oliverson here, and um, we would reach out to them early on to start developing programming. Um, OCCJ, a number of the partners I listed up there, Living Arts. So we really wanted people to come to us with the programming, and that, to a great extent, that's been successful. Um, Tulsa Roots Music is one that early on they developed their concert series and festivals. Um, Horton Records is another, and then we fill in the gap. So. Our programming staff is there to make sure all these things happen and make sure the technical needs are met. Um, but we also just fill in the gap. So we, at the beginning of the season, not all our Sundays are filled. We say, okay, we'll go in and we'll make sure there's a concert happening this day. And I'm lucky to have a really great staff, Shannon Easton and Meg Webb and Aaron, who make this happen. A lot of great ideas, have a lot of great connections. So. <clears throat> Uh, did I hear you right? You said the cost was like a half million dollars, and, and if so, was that to the foundation? And, and comment that doesn't seem like a lot. I mean, yeah, for, for what you obtain. Yeah, it depends on your perspective. Um, uh, before the board, it seems like a whole lot. Um, but that is that was the first kind of our first full year operating was around five hundred thousand. That includes security, uh, that includes all the landscaping maintenance. So the programming budget is probably more around 100 to 150,000 uh, just for artist fees that go out. Um, we save a lot of, you know, we save a lot of money. We've got a, uh, a sound system we purchased um, after the first few months. We knew it was like, okay, we need to buy a quality sound system so we don't have to rent that every time. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's probably not a lot, um, but it includes a lot of things. For example, security, it'll go down. We used to have off-duty police officers every night. We've now switched to a security service. We're saving a lot of money in that respect, looking to try to make a sustainable model. But, and it's mostly GKFF money. Uh, we do, we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and uh, we are starting a sponsorship program, bringing in people slowly. So like the fitness program sponsored by Fowler Toyota, Small things like that. So within my social circle, we consider Guthrie Green a huge success. We love going down there. It's great. It's great. Do you have something that you're planning over the next couple of years, or that you're implementing to bring it to a whole new level? Uh, a whole new level. Um, no, I think our big challenge. I mean, we our, we really want to sustain what we have. Um, there's really not much room in the calendar for much else. We'd love to be able to react quickly in the wintertime months when we have beautiful days. We want to try to program as much as we can throughout the year. We also do understand the need for having just quiet times at the Green. I don't know if you've seen our lawn, we do also like to try, try to keep that alive. Um, the, um, our big challenge is over the next few years kind of integrating with Gavin Place. How do we, that will have not be as programmed, it's going to be a little different feel there, um, but we are all working together and so how they work together will be a big challenge, whether we'll slow things down and go through green and ramp things up there, and even the structure, or will it be one entity and will the program, the program will always kind of coordinate as long as GKFF is running it, but um, that's one of our challenges. But in terms of ramping it up, I think we've, we've 
reached our capacity. We would love more people to come in with programming ideas uh, and more participation from other entities. So we're, you know, as much fun as it is, ramp down our programming and let other people bring activities there. You started to speak to this a little bit, but I'm just curious, what other things you guys have thought about um, implementing as far as keeping it sustainable? Um, I don't know how long the plan is to keep it going with the foundation money, but are there other systems you have in place? Obviously, it's great that it's free, yeah. but reducing costs to me doesn't mean sustainability. It just means less that you have to pay each year. Would that mean getting more sponsors for different types of events, or is there another avenue, something unique that you guys have, have found that will keep that going? Yes, I think the sponsorships will be a critical component of that. Um, and. Um, like I said, as we kind of develop a programming plan for Gathering Place, hopefully we'll work something into that as well. Um, we do, we've been, we do have fees for use of Guthrie Green, and um, we are pretty lax with those in terms of nonprofit uses, so we'd like more corporate uses for the park and be able to rent it out. We are pretty committed to keeping it free, the idea of having a, a once you open it up to having weddings and ticketed events, then it quickly become all that you have and it really eliminates the kind of public use of it. So my goal is to, to always keep it free and, and not have private uses of the park. Yeah. So what has been the thing since you've opened and maybe during the development that has been the biggest surprise problem that oh crap we didn't think that was gonna happen. How do we deal with this? Um, the lawn is a big problem. Uh, <laughs> It just never got a chance to survive, so we just replaced it here recently. Um, I think it, it was anticipating all the uses. Uh, it's pretty remarkable, I think, um, and really a testament to Tulsa's that we've had so few problems in terms of security issues. We have furniture sitting out there, and very few pieces have actually wandered off. Um, there's uh, so, and the people are kind of just the way people behave and police themselves and each other and, and it's been a pretty great, remarkable surprise. Um, problems are maintaining equipment. I, you know, we've learned a lot in terms of, you know, like the fountains. We've got, we've got four fountains that don't work right now. Um, the, uh, you know, I think we developed the park and launched so quickly that we, a lot of things got lost so we really have to go back and play catch up. Um, Karen, would you add anything to what things we've learned? Uh, I, the one thing I would add is, is that if there's a certain demographic that is there's a, a certain demographic that is drawn to the park naturally, and to expand beyond that demographic takes a lot more work than I think we anticipated, and a lot more relationship building. So, if we want to to reach out to um, you know different socioeconomic status people in Tulsa. If we want to reach out to different neighborhoods in Tulsa, like East Tulsa and North Tulsa, then uh, it takes more than just putting on one event. Um, it takes kind of a, a long, long time to build those relationships with those communities to get people to downtown to feel like they feel really comfortable and welcome. And I think that's probably something we didn't anticipate but are starting to really pick up on and take a more active role in expanding who feels like they can come to the park. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. That, that has been a big challenge. Um, and uh, the other thing is the staffing. I mean, we, we didn't know what we needed and um, there's certainly a lot of models out there, but um, I think we've, we've hit on it. Maybe we need a little bit more help, but uh, that, that was a, a trial and error. That's a good question. Um, it was, we didn't get a lot of early pushback, um, but I think it was something we anticipated. Um, because you know, this goes to kind of the broader, because we were working on the Tulsa Paper Company building, and we had a streetscaping plan to build connections to the Blue Dome, uh, Greenwood, Brady, and the BOK Center. Um, 
and uh, the so what we did is we stopped. We we had all these plans. It was a huge multi million dollar project, and um, anticipating that there would be pushback because you're coming into a neighborhood and just you know transforming it overnight. Um, it was really important to step back and say, all right, let's let's take a breather. And so what we did is we engaged uh, Tom Borup and George Sutton. Uh, Tom Borup is internationally known as kind of a community developer around the arts. And um, so what we did is we put uh, architects on hold for almost a year, pretty much, and uh, started a community kind of visioning process. So uh, we brought together the few residents in there, they're about one in there, um, business owners, and um, artists, and as many people as we could uh, from Brady, Greenwood, all over downtown, uh, to discuss kind of the plans. And this also included, we had the uh, driller stadium was coming in. So there was not just our projects, there were multiple projects. Uh, and not only were, was the dialogue with the community pretty low, the dialogue between the projects was pretty low as well. So you know, we're talking about, well, we're going to bump up right here, and you're going to bump up right here. How do we negotiate that? So. Um, we spent a year in an org. We had a big meeting with about 100 people, and then we spent uh, with a smaller group kind of, of stakeholders, about 25 over the course of a year, going through the plans, talking about what people wanted to see, what the vision, what are the good things, what are the bad things about the neighborhood. Um, so it was really about one thing. And then we entered out, came out the other side, everybody was enthusiastic about the park and, and the Pulse Paper Company building. So that's how we kind of tried to work around. Yeah. Uh, looking looking back, at that location seems like a pretty obvious good choice for Geoffrey, and then the location on Riverside seems like an obvious choice for the gathering place. But before you knew it was going to be successful, how did you how did you pick out that specific location, the one that's coming up on Riverside? And then I know it's probably down the road, but is there any talk about doing this in another part of town? And if so, how do you decide on the location? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I was uh, part of none of these discussions, so I was just kind of, uh, I came along and said, well, we're going to build a park there, and I was the project manager. But the, uh, from what I know, um, so Guthrie Green was just, it was the obvious place. It was right across from the Tulsa Paper Company building, and just like, this neighborhood needs some help, and you start fitting the pieces together. Uh, gathering Place was just opportunity, and I think, um, a lot of people probably driven down Riverside and say, look at that great big field, there's no way to access it really. Um, there's not even really any idea that you're invited to use that space, but it was clearly the best piece of property to create a space on the river. And um, I think, that's, to my understanding, uh, they knew the owner and they approached them and said, would you consider selling it? And uh, they were able to come to an agreement stay there for several years um, but it was you know and so the river improvements I think it was part of that we don't have a, a coast uh, so the Arkansas River is our coast and um, the foundation's been even before it was a foundation has been working on improvements to Riverside Drive and, and the trails and uh, this is just a lot of the pieces this we can create a great space that really makes the uh, riverfront an attractive spot so I think it was just a matter of opportunity and just there's no other large private, you know, piece of property. In terms of other projects, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, we don't know if there's really another project. I'm sure there will be one, um, but uh, we've been so busy trying to get through these two. I think maybe I have to think about it. So you talked a little bit about the gathering place and, and the location for it. Could you? discuss what is going to differentiate it from Guthrie Green and how you, you don't want to have two spaces that co that compete for the same you know, events and the same uh, audience. So that's how are they going to be different? Well, uh, the programming right now, they say this, I tell them they're wrong, but uh, that it really won't be a heavily programmed space. It's going to be a family place, there'll be food, um, and it's going to be, there's going to be playgrounds. Uh, it's going to be a pretty remarkable space to take your family picnic, play games, uh, play in the river, etc. There will be some program. You know, there's going to be cafes, so they'll have acoustic guys that come down and play. Uh, but it will not be event focused. I'm sure there'll be a lot of groups pushing them to 
to want to do things like symphony, kind of along, things like that. But the the idea is that Guthrie Green is really the performance arts focused space. That really, once you have an event there, there's little else you can do. And um, gathering place would be a larger, just a place for uh, for families to get together. But to avoid any conflicts, we'll all be working on it together on the program. Um, for the gathering place, we're really excited to see that come to life, but parking is always an issue. Is that something that you guys are looking at with the forethought of the growth that Tulsa is going to be having over the next several years? Is that something, I mean, because a lot of times it seems like we set it up for right now, yeah. and then a year from now there's nowhere to park. So is that is that something that you guys are definitely taking into consideration? The plan has hundreds of parking spots in a couple of different locations. Um, whether that's enough, who knows. Um, but it will add, I don't know the number, I apologize. Uh, it's several hundred more parking lots, parking spots to the River Parks area. Um, now, again, I don't know if that'll be enough, uh, but they certainly have done their best to accommodate as much parking as possible without paving the uh, gathering place itself. Okay, then to finish up, what can we, the community, do to help you succeed? Uh, well, um, if you have an organization, we encourage you to apply and apply now for next year for if you want to, if there's events you want to do. Um, we always need volunteers, um, and we need people to get the word out, continue to spread the word, um, and uh, just when more people bring your friends, bring people from out of town. And um, and if you have a company and you're interested in being involved in uh, Guthrie Green activities and you think you might want to do a sponsorship, we can, uh, we can accommodate you for sure. Aaron, is there anything you would add? Okay. All right, let's give it a hand for standing with that. Okay. We do, we, we're so glad that so many of you are here this morning and we see a few people standing up. If you would like to sit, there are some chairs over here. We invite you to take this, this announcement time to make yourselves comfortable. Uh, if you want to know what's going on at One Million Cups every week, who's presenting, and, uh, and get all the information that I'm about to tell you uh, in the link form, so you can actually go and reserve uh, tickets to, to the different events I'm about to tell you about. Then, all you need to do is send an email to Tulsa at onemillionpress.com and we will add you to the weekly newsletter. Um, oh, did you add the slide? It's later. Okay, cool. So, uh, we, we encourage you all to, to follow at Cultivate918 on Twitter and sign up for their, their mailing list, which is on their website. They're really trying to bring the entrepreneurial community together, like we're trying to do, um, to make it grow even more. They, they're meeting monthly, and they want more entrepreneurs. So if you're an entrepreneur, then they want you to come and get your feedback on how to make the entrepreneurial community better here in Tulsa. The Thrive 15 free trial is still going on. They, they're a former presenter here at One Million Cups, and you can get a free at least month using the, the code One Mill Cups. There's a demo day in, in Oklahoma City, so if you find yourself in that area on June 4th at noon, then you should go. And then I'd like to invite up uh, Danielle, who's going to tell us a little bit about Women 2.0, which is a global, right, international organization that's starting here in Tulsa. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Danielle Hastings. I am the co-founder of a Tulsa-based startup, and my business partner and I are bringing Women 2.0 to Tulsa. As uh, Baron mentioned, it's an international organization that's focused on um, increasing the roles of women in business. Um, it started out as women in technology, but as all of you know, technology is business, and business involves technology. So what we've done is we're bringing this meetup to Tulsa. Um, currently, the other cities where Women 2.0 meets are like New York, Barcelona, Buenos Aires, London, and Tulsa. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're really looking forward to it. It's not, this meetup is June 12th from 6.30 to 8.30. It's at the Phoenix. Um, it's not just for women. Um, men can come too. It's really for anybody who wants to increase diversity in the workplace and focus on supporting women in some of the more male-dominated industries. So 
Um, we're really excited about it, and uh, we hope we'll see you guys there. Thank you. So just pretend that it says for all people working in business instead of women working in technology. Uh, a, a previous presenter here, Diversity Connects, is having an event called Sex and Execs, which I think we can all agree is a very attention-grabbing title. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a discussion and networking event on June 26th. Again, if you want to know more about that, then sign up for the newsletter and we'll put the link there. If you have other theme ideas, for special editions, as I like to call them. This is our, in case you came in late, this is a special edition of One Million Cups Tall. So we usually have two startups present that are about three years old or less and are scalable, but we thought there's a lot more that's happening in the community than just that, than just the, that group of presenters. So we wanted to open it up to, to other presenters who are doing innovative projects uh, in, in different areas. So like Dustin said at the beginning, this is uh, Urban Community Edition. Next week or next month, we're gonna have the Arts Edition, when we're gonna have some more in the future. So if you have other ideas of uh, innovative projects or, or organizations that you think that One Million Cups community should know about, then we want to know, and, and we'll see if we can have a theme idea around that sometime in the future. Lastly, See Mackenzie Ward is over here. She and Al Pow won the Tri-State Business Plan Competition. They put out here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Delise Tomlinson, who's going to um, tell us a little bit more about what's going on in downtown Tulsa. And, and then she wants some feedback from us as well, which I'm sure we'll all be able to provide. So let's give a hand for Delise. to join you guys and, and be back there and listen. You always have wonderful questions, so I was having nightmares last night about what you guys might ask me. Um, as you said, I'm Delise Tomlinson. I'm the Executive Director of Downtown Development for the Chamber. And why do I have the job that I have? This is the background. I get asked this question all the time. Several years ago, our, our community, our region, was doing an economic development program. And downtown kept coming up with um, our large corporations and our smaller businesses that, uh, that enabled, to, for us to be able to attract and retain the kind of workforce that these companies need, they knew that we needed to have a vibrant downtown. And they know that it's very easy these days for people to, or the, the preference these days, so we're told, is people pick where they want to live over the job. And it's been very difficult to compete with places like Austin and Houston and Dallas and Denver and Oklahoma City is really up their game. So that is one of the reasons why uh, the Chamber made an emphasis on downtown development and, um, and I do what I do. And then I also get asked frequently, what is it that I do? And I scratch my head from time to time on that one too. Uh, cat herder, um, multiple things like that. Uh, it's far more political than I ever thought. My background is in planning, um, urban planning, and this was um, a little different than I thought it might be. Uh, and mainly what, what I'm char charged with doing is making sure that barriers are removed for development. So that the kind of things that we need in our downtown environment to attract people like you are here. That's why I, I said I'm going to have more questions, I think, for you guys. Uh, but just to get going uh, real quickly, what I wanted to do is just do a quick overview, very quick overview of projects that you guys already know quite a bit about. In fact, many of you, you here have likely been involved to some degree in some of these projects, but it's really cool to be able to see these all grouped together. I started tracking these when I came on the job in July of 2010. And since that time, we are at about the one billion mark of private and public investment in and around the IDL. And that's phenomenal. Uh, compare this to stats on other communities in our region. And for our size of community, we rank up way up there in the amount of investment. And, um, and one of our partners over there, GKFF, has a lot to do with that too. 
Then take a quick tour through our districts. The, the Greenwood District, as you guys know, has Green Arch Development that's been open for uh, over a year now. Uh, one of the amazing things about our residential, you've been hearing about this, is that they've remained pretty much at fully occupied. And that compares to about 92% occupied for the rest of our community, for the rest of the region in, in Tulsa region. The rents downtown are higher, and from what I've been told anecdotally, are going up higher. You know, that's the demand and supply thing. Um, but they typically, for um, the average rate for a one bedroom, is about $509. In, um, in downtown, that's, uh, that's about $1,200. So depending on, on the size of space that you're doing on a one bedroom, uh, kind of wild there. Uh, we have online, um, or just completed last year, about 110 residential units. And in 2014, we're expecting about 340 more to be coming online. Uh, the Vandiver is going to be one of those that will be opening up very soon, um, along with the uh, Hartford. Or not, or, uh, not Hartford. Uh, thank you so much. See, I told you, you guys know all the answers. Um, and then in 2015, we have about another, just under 400, but I think we're going to be hearing some new announcements in the next coming months. Um, also just breezing through the Brady Arts District, as you guys know, we've had um, several developments that have opened up the Griffins Communication Building, uh, Metro at Brady, and the Fairfield Inn, which just pops, particularly on weekends. I'm sure some of you guys might have stayed there on a holiday. Uh, and then also the AHA and um, uh, the Matthews Warehouse, which has been tremendous. Uh, one of the things that we love to do when people come into town and ask for things to do, we absolutely send them over to the Brady Arts District, tell them about the things that are going on at Guthrie Green, have them go through the, the Guthrie and have them go to Philbrook and duck their head into the Zero, uh, and also just, you know, even poke their head in. Um, over at uh, over the Griffin Communication. So, buzzing really quickly through. Um, there's your Guthrie Green. We've had a lot of different retail and restaurants open, as you guys well know. Um, and then um, recent things that have opened have been uh, the Mixon Company. And uh, you've probably seen over in Second and Boulder those condos going up. Those are, uh, those are 18 condos. I can give you more info about that if you want. Also, new things coming are the Hampton over at One Place and the Hilton Garden Inn. Uh, we're going to get quite a few hotels coming up. And, uh, and then several buildings are on, on deck for being converted into residential. So that's good news since we're saying we need residential. And that is the Adams, the old Adams Hotel, 111 um, West Main, the Vandiver that we said was going to be open, and Trans Oak Building. And I think I need to stop there. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> Call I'm me sure, if you want more. I'm sure we'll have a lot, a lot more to delve into. So now's our chance again to, to ask Denise about what's going on and try to help help them get better. And at, at some point, you want to ask questions? Yeah, I, I sure do. Do you want to do that now? Or May okay, I? Okay, so okay, let's ask you. questions for us, and we'll get the microphone. Okay. So you guys really are, generally speaking, our target audience. So one of the questions I have for you is how many people grew up in the Tulsa area? So quite a, quite a few of you. For those of you that did not, um, well, I'll ask you this first. Those of you that did, um, what caused you to stay? One at a time. <laughs> Just generally speaking, what people do is a quick sample. Uh, family, friends. And a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. I didn't stay, I've come back. And why? Downtown development. No, uh, family. <laughs> Anybody else? Any something different than family? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't stay either. I lived away for about two years in San Francisco and just moved back last September. And I think any city you live in, you're going to sacrifice something, whether that's a beach or a mountain or uh, good coffee or cost of living. You know, it's a lot cheaper to buy milk here than it is in San Francisco. Um, and I'm, I'm starting that company with my co-founder. And I moved back to Tulsa because it's a lot easier to have an intimate connection with people that are really willing to do something for you in a city where you have a lot of roots and uh, a genuine foundation. And that's something that's a huge competitive advantage and that I'm sacrificing if I go live in a really dense city. 
great. Thank you. That's really helpful. And for those of you that um, are not from Tulsa but are here now, what brought you? Hi, um, I'm actually hopefully in the process of moving here permanently from South Carolina. And, um, and I can say that when I first came to Tulsa, it was actually for the Route 66 Marathon, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be running through a wheat field. No offense to you guys. Um, but, and I really didn't know what Oklahoma had to offer. And when I came to Tulsa, I was blown away not only by how friendly the people are and how beautiful it is here, but also, for me, it is a big part of The downtown is a huge draw for me because not only seeing how hard you guys are working to develop it, but also how involved the community is and that they want to be downtown and people are coming from different areas of the city to go to things like Guthrie Green. That's something we don't have where I live, and so um, if I do move here, I, that would be a huge draw. So I can honestly say that that was important to me. I moved here from Milwaukee, and the reason I came was because Tulsa had the strangest university in the world where I could get the education I actually wanted. But what kept me here was the entrepreneurial community is enormously helpful. Uh, it's made up of all kinds of people who go out of their way to go out and help you. And it's, it's just amazing that the people here in the business community is much more willing to try new things than where I came from in Milwaukee. And um, the weather is nicer up there, but that's about it. And, and before we get and uh, continue, I want to point out uh, what somebody I consider a partner in crime, and that is Tom Baker. He's the manager of the Downtown Coordinating Council. He's, he's back there looking, trying to hide. Uh, but I asked him to be here this morning just because he, uh, he works with Downtown Coordinating Council. They are funded through the assessment that uh, property owners pay, and uh, they provide uh, cleaning and safety and marketing for the downtown area, among many other things, and, and are a huge supporter of events downtown. But anyway, I just wanted to point him out so he can help. Uh, um, I moved here about a year ago um, from the Dallas area, but I moved here specifically for what was happening downtown. Um, I moved here to uh, open a uh, bar with my business partner, and we looked, uh, I'm from Texas, we looked throughout Texas and Oklahoma, some of the areas, but we were really excited about what was going on downtown and we also looked at um, not only where we wanted to open up a, a business, but also the um, where we wanted to live. And Tulsa was the highest for both those. And you don't have to say nice things just because I work for the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, I, that, that's really helpful. Um, we often hear that family is a reason people will come back, and I think you guys have highlighted some of the reasons why. It, it provides you a network, which this has been really important. Uh, you have a lot of resources for uh, for entrepreneurism with this and with the mine and with uh, the forge and a variety of other things. But I know you're going to summarize this by asking this question. But one of the things I'm going to be looking to you for is how can I help you? How can I help you in your efforts uh, related to downtown? Is there anything Tom can do as well? Because what you are doing, the fact that you are here, is really important to us, and we want to help foster that. Okay, I think we may have a couple of answers already. <laughs> Hi, Elise. My name is Cal Morris. I work with the SCORE Foundation here. I don't know how well you know it or others here in the group, but SCORE is a national organization with uh, 11,000 volunteers and 360 chapters. In some of the major ch city chapters, the chambers come to them asking for uh, guidance on how to bring businesses in. Their presentations are booklets. They have programs like Drive Time, where businesses call in on the drive in in the morning and drive out and ask the score volunteers for solving problems and questions. Just terrific programs. We have a great chapter here. We have 30 volunteers, uh, about 60% retired and 40% working, CPAs, attorneys retired execs from the major corporations, people that have run businesses, that all offer free counseling time, mentoring time to new business starts. And we work closely with the chamber. Uh, Heather Davis has been supporting us as she feels she can be. We work with the mine, we work with the SBDC here. We have a lot of agencies that help uh, small businesses get started, but one of our problems that I wanted to pass along to you and the others in the group is a little frustration with the government bureaucracy of the chamber. We're a member of the chamber, and we have outstanding seminars that have been developed nationally. Five-part series for existing businesses that want to grow to the next level. 
and a five-part series, two and a half hours each for startup businesses that want to come in. We have tremendous presenters, retired CEOs, accountants, CPAs that do the different sections, marketing executives. Our frustration is we're not getting enough people to our seminars. Uh, we, should, we have 20 people when we want 40 people. We have 40 people when we want 100 people. And one of the things the chamber could do to help us that's been frustrating their bureaucracy is using their promotion system to do it. And as a member, just even emailing information out, things like that, on the societies we've fallen into the trap of, if we do it for you, we have to do it for everybody else, that kind of thing. I'm sure there's a simple way to solve that problem. That's the issue I want to pass along to you. We can talk more. Hey, that's really great feedback. Um, I, mine's very similar to that, to where I hear a lot of programs, not just with Tulsa, but every single city, about bringing big business into the city and about the large corporations. And if we're to target audience, I'd love to see more programs like the Forge Incubation Center, where you get uh, tax benefits for being part of the incubator program. Even that is a very well-kept secret. I think my CPA thought I was high when I first told him that there was a program like that. I had to prove it to him. So more things that just come down from the top, helping startups, helping smaller businesses grow from the bottom up instead of focusing on the larger corporations. I think you're going to see a lot more emphasis and probably have, as you mentioned, Heather Davis, and there's a small business council that's really been revamped. Quite a bit more emphasis on small business because it actually is and represents a larger percentage of our overall membership in the chamber. And, uh, and certainly that's not just entrepreneurs, but our small businesses started out that way. And we, we recognize that, so you'll see more. Um, and, and, my, and when I say this, I'll be able to pass a lot of this on. Some of this you probably already know. I've talked with some of my partners at the, at the chamber. My emphasis is downtown, in the, and there are, there are things that I can come alongside with Heather that we've debated, and now we probably won't have to do that, but talked about having a, a, a women's networking, um, a business owner, women business owner networking opportunity, and maybe focusing more around downtown, just because we saw that that was something missing. So maybe there's a way we can help you guys out. Some great things, kind of a hug and a kick here. The big thing, I, I actually lived in downtown, I'm from Pryor. I lived in downtown in 1998, like pre-BOK, all that stuff. Wow. It was a scary town. I had to carry a knife, <laughs> like really. Uh, I love it now. I think it's great. We live south though, and the only difference really that, and I'm really excited to see there's a lot more residential coming this way. The only thing that keeps us from downtown is the, the incredible school system south of Tulsa. You know, family's a big part of why people stay here, and there's great colleges downtown. It's just... Tulsa Public, it, it doesn't really meet the standards that we're going for. We just can't beat the South Tulsa School District. So that's one of the big things that, that keep us from, from coming. We come downtown every week, every day I work here, but it's just a matter of living here. To, to actually live down here. And, and, and we definitely recognize that. That's a, as you know, that's a big, big issue. Something that's going to, um, I wish that we could just wave a magic wand and fix that. Uh, that is getting higher and higher on the radar of, of, of many people about how we can overcome that. Oklahoma City is actually addressing that through one of their MAPS projects. So uh, I think... Be more yeah, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of, uh, literally, education of the public to support the kind of things that would be needed to do that. But uh, there's, there's someone that you should talk to named Brian Pascal. Okay. Uh, I had a two-part question, but that was half of it, so I don't feel bad hogging. Um, what constitutes downtown? Is anything inside the, the IDL? Is that... that depends on who you ask. If you ask the gentleman over there, uh, it would be the IDL, okay. uh, because that is where the uh, those that are paying assessments for the Stadium Improvement District are paying in from this area. For me, it's that, and then areas that are adjacent to. Uh, and so, uh, looking at the Pearl District, some people from the South Boston area have contacted me and really want to be integrated more. Um, people are associating themselves with downtown more and more, and, and that's actually better. We, we want that to happen. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, inside the idea, there's not a lot of houses, it's mostly condos and apartments and stuff. And you talked a few months ago at a small business forum at TCC that I was at. Um, my question is, is there a concerted effort inside either the chamber or the organizations that you're working with to try to uh, improve 
the surrounding neighborhoods. I'll use Brady Heights as, a, as an example. There's a lot of people that have moved in and they're restoring homes, but then it's like maybe right next door to what once was or currently still is a meth house. You know, and, and so we looked for about six months for a home in and around downtown. Worked really, really hard, tried to make it work, and it just didn't. One was the schools, two was just the fact that I might find a great house, but the next three homes down the street are just falling apart. And so I didn't know if making homes part of like the Tulsa Historic Society or just doing something to where you can set standards for homes as people buy them and know that they're not throwing their money into a neighborhood that's in three years just gonna fall apart again. Because that would be a big reason for us to move downtown if we had some security within those types of neighborhoods. Right, and you know, that's kind of an interesting process a lot of communities go through. Um, a very ugly word for it is gentrification, but that's some of what um, happens. There actually is somebody who could better answer those questions. That would be Steve Carr. That's a planning, the, the planning department at the city does small area plans. Kendall, Kendall Whittier, you're probably familiar with some of the work that they've done there. That's where we used to live before we broke the arrow. Instead of downtown. Yeah, right. Oh, well, we've just gone through that with my daughter who's, who's, um, who's gone away to school and come back and, and moved and trying to find a place. And it's, yeah, it's interesting. But, uh, the answer is yes. There, there are works um, that's oftentimes tied in the CDBG. Um, it's also tied in with uh, the city with security and policing and that kind of thing. Better person to answer that question would be Steve Carr. But, but uh, these areas are on the radar. They are being worked on, and parts of them are being encompassed in small area plans, included like Eugene Field. So, a lot going on. If we could, we have a few minutes left, why don't we direct it back to questions that we can ask you, which has already been done a little bit. So Dustin here has a question for you. Um, well, I just tweeted out a minute ago about uh, kind of our discussion and asked people why do they love Tulsa and what, what brought them back here. And uh, a friend of mine tweeted back at me and said, kind and generous people, big city benefits with small town feel, running trails, renewing downtown, and music scene. So I think that captures a lot of what we were talking about. Sorry, that was not a question, but I do have a question. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm setting a poor example. Uh, so from a, a development standpoint, obviously you've been involved with a lot of um, big developments and smaller developments, things that are going on. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the process of a hotel, of um, you know, BOK Center, or one of fields, you know, these various things that come into um, coming to downtown. What that process is like, and what are some of the the roadblocks that you find that you run into? What are some of the cool things that people say? Oh yeah, I wanna I wanna do this, and then what do you think is the next big opportunity? Uh, without giving it away, anything away that you can't give away for downtown. What do you think is the next thing that needs to happen? Yeah, if I tell you, I have to kill everybody in here. Okay, I'm a middle-aged woman, and you're making me remember stuff, so let me see. Okay, uh, development process. There are two different things. When you're talking about a public, um, and really very few of our things have been entirely public, both the ballpark and BOK had private contributions, quite a bit, a, a bit of that being corporate contributions. But somebody, let's say somebody has a great idea, and they want to do something. I would say probably the biggest roadblock of all is funding. It's the biggest, but I mean, it is the same thing when you guys are working on businesses. Um, it is more expensive to develop downtown. That is a fact. It's not unique to Tulsa. It's anywhere you go. Um, if you're talking ground up, there's stuff that's happened under the ground that um, that has preceded whatever development you're doing. So there could be some old pipes. There could be um, there could be some contamination of different types, and so there's a lot of work that has to be done to get the ground ready for development. Then there's the cost of infrastructure. Yes, one of the great things about downtown is it's infill development. You're using what's already there, sort of. You already have water, you already have sewer to that site, but oftentimes it does not meet current code. And so bringing that up to code is, has been very, very expensive. Um, and you know, there could be lead pipes, there could be those kind of things, or even just you know clay pipes. In any case, they usually, have to be replaced. Um, and then there's electric, a lot of times when people want to redevelop, and I'm just talking about, let's say we want to get this parking lot redone. Um, you're going to have to move electrical lines. A lot of times we'd like to, to bury them, but that's a, an expensive, it's considerably more expensive than having them overhead. So it's expense. 
let's say you want to redevelop one of our um, existing buildings, you run into a similar situation. You're not necessarily having to do anything to the pipes in the ground, but you might, you still might, but you're having to bring up the building to fire code. Um, you're having to oftentimes replace build or windows. Um, the, these days now, because we've been having some earthquakes, um, I know uh, looking at the Vandiver, they had to do, uh, they had to reinforce they did it in a very cool architectural style way. So um, it just looks like a really funky, cool feature, but it's to make sure that the building um, will remain stable if the ground isn't. Uh, a lot of those kind of things are really expensive. That's why we have things like historic tax credits that are out there, new market tax credits. Um, the city has done a few abatements, those kind of things. Without them, it would not happen. Every developer you would line up here would tell you, you cannot do it. So there have got to be some kind of incentives. One of the things that we've been really working on very hard over at the state and at the federal level is making sure we don't lose our historic tax credits. Uh, it's probably one of the best policed tax credits that's out there. You have to perform to be able to get the credit. Um, and I won't go into the how those all work. You probably know. But um, in any case, it's been a battle. We've been very busy to make sure we don't lose them because we know if we do, we run out of a very great source to redevelop our buildings and we have a wonderful stock of buildings. Hi, yeah. I'm curious to know if your marketing strategy focuses more on bringing people to Tulsa that are currently living like in Oklahoma and keeping them here or if it focuses more on bringing people in from out of state. And if it is focusing on people from out of state, how do you work to change the perceptions of Oklahoma that people who have never been here have? I'm going to start with your latter part of your question. There is a, a branding process that's going on right now for Tulsa as a whole, and uh, and that really is part of it. Downtown is a small subset of it, and that's where they're working on on um, external. Uh, they're working along with the city on that, which is different than visitor. So the the convention and visitors bureau the visit Tulsa has their uh, approach, so they're a little bit different. Um, as far as local, that's something that actually Tom and I are working on right now. Um, we have two different websites, and I'm just answering this in a very small way right now. We have two different websites that we're working to bring together, so we, we have one centralized location where you can find out what's going on downtown, um, as well as where you can live, where you can eat, those kind of things. And, um, and quite frankly, we're open to hear. Right, we right now are kind of in a lull on how we're marketing and are interested in hearing from you how it would be a great way to reach out locally um, and whether there's merit to look, you know, reach out within the state as well. We just want people that are down in South Tulsa to come up here and spend some time for some of them. It's just a big deal for them to come up here. All right. And, um, Delise, if you could tell us how we as a community can help you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to leave, and you probably can find it, my uh, email phone. If you guys have, uh, let me know. Reach out to me how you might, uh, uh, if you have some questions, how we might be able to be of assistance. Certainly, getting a list, of, of, it was not just a fluff question about what it is that caused you to come here and what caused you to stay here. If you have other things that your friends and, and others that have come, ask them that question. You know, what brought you here? Sometimes a lot of people I ask it was a job. We really want to know because we want to know what works. And, uh, and, and family is an important thing. I don't know that we can put each person's mom or dad on a poster and say, come here for this. But there's a way that we can really um, be able to share that in a meaningful way. So I think that would be extremely helpful. You guys stay, you guys like it, you're involved. How do we, how do we make sure other people Without giving them the, the secret away too much, we don't want to. All right, let's give Delisa a hand. Again, this um, was just our first special edition of One Million Cups. We're looking for more themed ideas, so just let us know. Um, uh, just a couple things. We've got some cards on the back, some invite cards to One Million Cups. I heard a few people said they have some startups. If you haven't presented, you can go to the website and a request to present. We'd love to have you. And uh, you guys have a great week. We'll see you next week.